Well, it's good to be with you tonight via live stream. Uh, we're going to be looking in Genesis chapter 17. Uh, Genesis chapter 17. And we'll be going through uh, the whole chapter, just kind of highlighting different verses. I want to share a message entitled Establishing the Family. And uh, this morning we looked at a portrait of a loving family. And we're going to continue our, our evaluation of Abraham in reference to the family. Hopefully there'll be some practical uh, truths here that'll help you, especially you fathers and uh, determining to lead your family in spiritual things. And certainly it would help each of us, no matter whether you're a father or whether you're single or whether you're a man or whether you're a woman, there, every one of these principles will apply uh, to your life and certainly to my life in helping us to uh, fulfill the role of leadership in helping others to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to just read our text verses, Genesis chapter 17 and verse 5, and then we're going to go ahead and highlight the other verses throughout the chapter. Genesis chapter 17 and 5 says, Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made of thee. Establishing the family. God says of Abraham that for a father of many nations have I made thee. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be together tonight and to be able to study the word of God, how precious it is to our hearts. And uh, Lord, help us to uh, have discernment give us the holy spirit to be our teacher and guide through the scriptures tonight uh, may we glean some practical truths that will help every one of us in uh, the leadership roles that you may provide for us and desire for us to fulfill and especially today father's day we're thankful for every man we're thankful for every father we're thankful lord that uh, you can uh, move and you can bless in ways that we haven't even thought of you can use us and beyond our skills and our abilities. You can do miraculous work in each of our hearts. And so, Lord, speak to us in a special way. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, what a great verse. It says in verse 5, Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. You know, the home or the family is really based on God's covenant. As you go through this chapter, chapter 17 of Genesis, you'll find the word covenant or mentioning God's covenant is used 13 times in this chapter. And I'm not going to read all the verses, but there's 13 verses and you can do a study yourself and go through and read this chapter and everywhere it says covenant, underline that word covenant. And then look at what it is God is saying in regards to the covenant that he was making with Abraham and a covenant basically is a signed contract it's an agreement uh, that between two different people and God is acknowledging his contract that he had with Abraham he said I'm going to make you a father of many nations and and another thing is it's interesting is you just come some introductory thoughts about the chapter this covenant of God is unconditional uh, because eight times in the chapter, God says in reference to his covenant, I will. So if God's doing it, that's nothing that has to do on man's part. So the covenant of God is unconditional. And uh, there's, you think of the covenant, Jesus said, when that in reference to the Lord's Supper, he said, this is the blood of the New Testament. It literally means this is the blood of the New Covenant. And uh, the New Covenant that God has made for, with us is an unconditional covenant. God loves us unconditionally. Uh, you know, he, and that's why he provided the salvation through Christ being the sacrifice on Calvary. It was the will of God. It was the work of God that provided redemption for man. Man cannot provide that redemption himself. And so the covenant is identified as unconditional. So it'd be a good study for you. Go through the chapter, 
underline or highlight the word covenant, go through the chapter and underline and highlight the, how many times God says, I will. And then I see not only is the covenant unconditional, but it is active. In other words, we can have a part in that covenant because God says eight times, I will, but six times he says to Abraham, thou shalt. And I think sometimes we forget that, that even though God makes a covenant through the blood that was shed so that we might be able to be saved, uh, there are things that God demands or requires of us in living that life, satisfying that covenant that God has made for us. And so uh, six times as you go through the chapter, you see God saying to Abraham, thou shalt. So establishing the family. It is interesting that in this chapter that he identifies Abraham as being a father of many nations. And so that's where I got my title, establishing the family. If he's going to be the father of many nations, uh, then there's some truths here that will help us in that establishing a family or a Christian home. So let's look at a few of these things. We're going to go through the chapter. And first of all, I think we have it up on the screen there. And we'll be putting the outline of the message on the screen if you're taking notes and uh, you can go back and, and uh, look them up later and do a father study. First of all, about establishing the home or the family is the power of God. Notice in verse one, it says, when Abraham was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared unto Abraham and said unto him, I am the almighty God, walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant with thee between me and thee and, and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying, as for me, behold, my covenant was, is with thee and thou shalt be a father of many nations. And so the power of God, I want you to see that man's age does not hinder God's power. And oftentimes people say, well, I could never be a father. I could never guide a home. I could never be in ministry. I could never do anything uh, in leadership. Uh, well, wait a minute. You, know, you try to make excuses for your age. And Abraham here is 99 years old. And God has told him he's going to make him a father of many nations. If I was Abraham, I would have said, well, couldn't you start maybe 60 or 70 years ago? <laughs> I'm 99 years old. And uh, But wait a minute. Uh, the amazing thing is this, that his age does, did not hinder the power of God to be accomplished in his life in establishing the nation of Israel. And I want to encourage you tonight, when we talk about leadership, we talk about the home life, uh, sometimes people say, well, I'm just too old. Uh, well, you know, it, with age, there may come changes in our life, but we're never too old to let the power of God move through us. And it's a, actually, it's a good thing to be in a situation where we can't do what we used to do because now the power of God can manifest itself in a greater way. And so man's age does not hinder God's power. Why? Because in verse 1, God is uh, El Shaddai. He says here, oh, uh, I am the Almighty God. And when you think about, I don't remember what I put on there. I did put El Shaddai. Uh, it means the Almighty God. El means the strong one. If you break down this compound word, El Shaddai, El means the strong one. Shaddai means breast. Thus, he is the nourisher and the strength giver. And uh, God is about ready to do something miraculous in the life of uh, Abraham. And he wanted to remind Abraham, wait a minute, Abraham, this is not about you. You're already too old to do anything, and I just want you to know that I'm with you. I'm El Shaddai. I'm the one that can nourish you and strengthen you and bless you and work in you. And so the power of God is evidence there. Why would he say that at that point in this verse? I think it's because he says, I am almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. I think this matter of uh, Abraham being able to walk before God and to be perfect before God is based upon El Shaddai. 
We often think, well, you know, I've had people say, oh, it's just too hard to live the Christian life. Well, it is hard to live the Christian life. Uh, what God expects out of us, what the world condemns us for, and yes, it becomes a challenge many times. But we don't live the Christian life based on our strength and our abilities. We walk before God and we're perfect before God because he's El Shaddai. Uh, he is the one that is going to be give, give us the strength and the ability to go on. And so uh, it's based on who God is. And so these statements to be fulfilled is based on the fact that Almighty God is working on his behalf. And listen, God can help you walk for, with him. God can help you to be perfect before him. And the word perfect is always interesting. It doesn't mean without sin. It means to be maturing. It means to be growing. And no matter where we are in our life, what stage in life we are in, we all can still be growing and maturing in our understanding and our commitment to our God. So it's based on, on who God is. Then I see that God's covenant is very personal. In verse 2, he says, I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And so God's covenant is very personal. And God has a plan and a design specifically for you. And I, I just think when I got saved, God called me to ministry, different ministries I've been involved in, and certainly being here for almost 25 years now. Uh, it was not on my mind at all that I could do what God has called me to do. Uh, so God had made a covenant with me. God had made promise to me that he would use me. And I just have tried to live in light of the personal work that God has for me. What God has for you in your life may be different than someone else, uh, but it's still as important and as significant as someone else's call on their life. And so God's covenant is personal. Get, get a message from God. I mean, God is directly talking to Abraham. He's not talking to anybody else. He's talking directly with Abraham. So the covenant is personal. Notice the covenant is practical because we're talking about building the family. We're talking about establishing the family. It's very uh, oh, um, uh, practical because of the fact he says, and he will multiply thee exceedingly. Now, Abraham is 99 years old and God saying he's going to multiply him and establishing a nation. And I just know this, God can increase you where you need to increase. Uh, God can give you strength where you feel you are weak. God can give you understanding when you don't comprehend what is going on. The covenant of God is very practical, and it's very practical in the life of Abraham. And oftentimes people think, well, I just couldn't be a leader in my home. Uh, yes, you can. A lot of times men feel intimidated because women are smarter than we are. <laughs> they really are. I'm not a good reader. When God called me to preach, I tell you, I, I argue with God about that because I'm not a good reader. And many of you have heard me read for quite a while, so you know I can't read real good. And I hated reading. When I went into high school, I, and when I went to ninth grade, I was still on a fifth grade reading level. And uh, because they never taught me how to read. So I'm not a reader. I force myself to read because of the fact that when God called me, I was like, Lord, you're making a mistake because I don't like reading. And But it was very practical in that God had made a covenant with me that he would bless me and use me. And I'm thankful for what God has done in my life over the years in giving me what I specifically need to be a leader in my home, to be a leader in the church. Uh, certainly God wants to bless you and he can use you. The covenant of God is practical. Notice in verse three, the power of God is humbling. In verse three, it says, and Abraham fell on his face and God talked with him. And it is a humbling thing to come under the power of God. I've been in church services, man. I'll tell you where the power of God came down. Uh, I remember I was in Bible college. Uh, one service I was in, in a chapel service, the pe preacher came in and he was preaching. And I'm going to tell you, the air felt like you had to slice it with a knife. It was so thick. It was so powerful. 
the presence of the Spirit of God was so permeating upon everybody's heart. I remember being at the prayer advance once and and the uh, first time I went there and I heard this, this preaching going on and, and about the Spirit of God and the power of God working in our life. And I, I literally I literally felt that if I moved, God would strike me dead. I'm telling you, the power of God can be released in your life, but it's a humbling experience. Some of this flippant attitude that I see some of these preachers going off and some be, uh uh, church uh, services going on and it makes a light of the power of God. I'm going to tell you, you get in the presence of God, you're not going to be boasting of anything. You're not going to be standing up in, in his face. You're not going to be rebuking God. I'm going to tell you, you're going to be on your face, humble because of the power of God is beyond what you can comprehend or understand or experience. Right. And so Abraham, when God spoke to him in reference to his covenant, about the power of God that was going to work in his life, Abraham fell on his face and God talked with him. I, and I just another thought, I just thought of this. When you humble yourself before God, God will talk to you. You know, sometimes we say, I've had people say, well, God, God doesn't speak to me. Uh, sometimes, and I'm a nice person, so I wouldn't say this, but uh, sometimes I feel like saying, well, why don't you just shut up for a while? Uh, because it's like we, when we go to prayer, you know, the main thing is when we go to prayer, we act like prayer is just us talking all the time. Mm -hmm. oh, wait a minute, why don't you let the Lord get a word in edgewise once in a while? Right. Why, why don't you go into prayer with the spirit of being willing to listen for the still small voice of God? Right. But we, we think we got to consume all of our time in prayer with us talking. Yeah. Well, here is Abraham. Uh, God is speaking to him and, and he's humbled by the promise of the power of God to be revealed in him and it humbles him. He falls on his face and so God starts talking to him. If we'll humble ourselves in the presence of God, we might be able to hear something that the Lord has for us. So we see the power of God. We talk about establishing a family, talk about the home, we talk about leadership. We're talking about the power of God that does what man cannot do. Number two, in verse 4 through 15, I see the position of Abraham. And uh, the position that he's going to have in verse 4, because it says it twice, that he is to be a father. Notice in verse 4, as for me, behold that my covenant is with thee. And here's what he says, thou shalt be a father of many nations. Then verse 5, it says, Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be called Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. Two times in two verses following each other, God makes this statement, Abraham, you're going to be a father of many nations. Now listen, when God repeats himself, we need to pay attention. And God is confirming with Abraham what his role is going to be. So in other words, he was no longer going to be Abram. That's what it tells us in verse 5. Abram means exalted father. But he says, your name's not going to be Abram any longer. It's going to be Abraham. And Abraham means a father of a multitude. And it's interesting that God changes his name to reveal the promise or the covenant that God was making with him, that he would be a father of many nations. Uh, may I say this, that God can change and redefine your life if he's called you to be a father. He can, listen, he can change and rearrange your life if he's called you to be in a position of leadership. Uh, whatever it is God is directing you to do, I want you to know that God can do it in a miraculous way and uh, he's told Abraham, your position is you're going to be the father of many nations. Then he tells him that he is to be a leader in verse 6 and 7. It says, and I will make thee exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee uh, in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And so Abraham is to be a leader of these nations that God is going to bring up through his loins. And uh, God wants you to lead. 
Uh, you know, they always said, I've heard years ago, that old saying, people say, well, you see a need, take the lead. Uh, well, that's a great little cliche, but the reality is we need believers in Christ rising up and taking the lead, fulfilling the covenants and promises of God, whether it be in our homes or whether it be in our church or whether it be in our community, Christians need to take on leadership roles. And uh, why? Because if God's going to be able to establish a nation, you think about this country, this country was established by different ones who were believers in God and believers in Christ who took the lead to establish this nation. And so we're going to have a nation or a family or a church, whatever it may be, that is established by God, then it's going to require people taking a role of being a leader. And Abraham was to lead his family and lead his nation. So not, not only was he to be a father and a leader, but in verse 8, he was to be a protector. Notice in verse 8, it says, And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger in all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And so Abraham was to be a protector. The land that God was going to give him, he was to protect it and preserve it. And even though he was a stranger in that land, it was the land that God had promised to his people Israel. And so let's protect the things that we know. Let's protect the things that we believe. Uh, let's not turn our back on doctrinal truths. Let's not turn our back on, uh, um, on responsibilities to ensure that our homes are a safe haven, our church is a safe haven. Uh, we need to be a protector. And then I see that he was to be a spiritual mediator in verses 9 through 14. I'm thankful that we have Christ as our mediator. There's but one mediator, mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. I'm thankful that he's interceding for us at the throne of God. But I do know this, that God wants us to intercede for others also. And so we need to be a spiritual mediator. Uh, who, who, are you, uh, who are you molding in their faith? Uh, who are you being a mentor to? Uh, Abraham was to be a mentor and he was to be a spiritual mediator. And I believe that God has given us great opportunities to be able to do the same thing. I want you to see four things here in verses 9 through 14, this matter of being a spiritual mediator. First of all, I see in verse 9 and 10 that uh, it begins with Abraham. And God said unto hate Abraham. So it starts with him. He's not talking to anybody else. It begins with him. But I say there's always a starting point with somebody. And any great moves of God, any great accomplishments for God has always been birthed out of somebody that God spoke to who was willing to be a mediator of the things God has revealed to others. And so in uh, verse 9, God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant before, uh, keep my covenant therefore, thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and thy seed uh, after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. So literally it begins with Abraham because the covenant is between Abraham and his God. But as it begins with Abraham, it extends to the family. Because what God was dealing with and requiring of Abraham was the same thing that he was going to extend to his family and expect that out of his family also. God would cause Abraham to be circumcised to identify that he was a child of God. And that circumcision uh, would be used on his uh, family, his children, his sons, that they might also uh, be identified with the covenant of the Lord. It's interesting in verse 10, he says that every man child among you shall be circumcised. And so what God requires of the leader, he requires of others also. And oftentimes I have people over the years say, well, preacher, you know, it's nice you preach on that, but you're a pastor. <laughs> what does that mean? I mean, you know, I understand that with leadership roles, there are greater, greater 
leadership responsibility, the greater requirements that are placed upon you. But realize this, before we're leaders, we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. And listen, what God requires of me is the same thing he requires of you. And Abraham, spiritual, being a spiritual meter, mediator, this whole concept of spiritual relationship with God began with Abraham, but it extended to his family. Why? In verse 12, it tells us it was an outward expression of an inward relationship. In verse 12, it says, and when he is, uh, that is eight days old, shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generations. Uh, for uh, he that is born in the house or bought with money of any stranger, which is not thy seed. And so he said, this was going to be an outward expression of an inward relationship. And uh, may we be reminded when it comes to establishing the family or building the Christian home uh, that God wants us to in a personal way have a relationship with him uh, the church I grew up in they didn't tell me how to be saved uh, the church I grew up in they had a lot of requirements that they would put upon you the church I grew up in told me when I was 13 I needed to be baptized to become a member of the Baptist church and all those things they told me they never told me about a personal relationship with Christ they always said that Jesus died for the sins of the world, but they never said he died for my sins. And all they did was keep everything in a generic statement and position. That is not the God of heaven. The God of heaven has a personal relationship with us. And so Abraham's leadership spiritually extended to his family, and it was an outward expression of an inward relationship. Notice in verse 14 that it was necessary for all. In verse 14, it says, And the uncircumcised man-child whose uh, flesh of the foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. And so when the Bible tells us that all of sin come short of the glory of God, when the Bible tells us except that you be born again, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven, when the, when the scriptures are clear that we must repent or we all shall likewise perish, I mean, this is serious business. And I'm thankful that we have a mediator that is Jesus Christ. But what he requires of me in order to go to heaven is what he requires of you. And so this spiritual intercession, this spiritual mediator uh, that Abraham was to be uh, passed on a necessity for everyone to fulfill the requirement of the covenant and uh, they were to be circumcised so he was to be a father a leader a protector a spiritual mediator but he was also according to verse 15 to be a husband and uh, verse 15 it says that god said unto abraham as for sarai thy wife thou shalt not call her name sarai but sarah shall be her name you know sometimes we have to be careful men uh, men like to solve problems uh, they like to be the hunter that goes out and catches the game uh, they like to be involved in everything that needs to be done and then the process of taking care of your children the process of doing ministry and the process of working your job and providing for your home you forget you're supposed to be a husband <laughs> and uh, that that requires some things first of all it says here that her name was Sarai Sarai means uh, my princess but she's changed her, God said to change her name to Sarah. Sarah means a princess or a noble woman. And listen, that signifies a position over the multitudes. And so as being a husband, he was to honor his wife in a like position that he was fulfilling in. And oftentimes we deal with submission and all these different concepts about how we're supposed to relate to one another in the marriage. And we get, sometimes we get this idea that men are better than women and men are to put the women down and all this, that, and the other. That is not what is taking place in reference to Abraham being a husband. Don't call her Sarai. Don't say she's my princess. You call her Sarah because she is a noble woman. And her position is the same as your position 
Uh, she is position over the multitudes. And it not only signifies the position over the multitudes, but it signifies the provision of the prince to come. And if she is a princess, then there's got to be a prince. And so it prophetically reveals that the Messiah was coming. And certainly we see that. I'm going to get ahead of myself and we're not say that yet. So he was to be a leader. He was to be a father. He was to be a uh, protector, a spiritual mediator, and he was to be a husband. So uh, continue on. Here's our thought, last thought, verses 16 through 7, 27, I'm sorry. The promise confirmed. A covenant is a promise. God confirmed the promise with Abraham of what his role was to be and how God was going to use him. But now God is going to confirm that promise uh, that he uh, made with Abraham. Notice, first of all, the means of the fulfilled promise in verse 16. He said, I will bless her. Now remember, he's 99 years old. He doesn't have a child yet. He says, I will bless her and give thee a son also of her Yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. And so he goes, listen, it goes, the means of the fulfilling of the promise is that God was going to take this 99-year-old man and this 90-year-old woman and give them a child that he had promised to bless them with. And that child is going to develop nations of people that are going to be established because of this woman, Sarah, and this man, Abraham. God has a way of fulfilling his promises. Isaiah 7, 14, uh, God said he would give a sign. And what was that sign? That a virgin would conceive and bring forth a son. And certainly this matter of Sarah miraculously receiving this son, the promised son, uh, through God's covenant with Abraham does extend a prophetic statement in reference to the Messiah that would come and be born of Mary. And so uh, the means of a fulfilled promise. Notice in verse 17, the mocking of the promise. You know, it's always interesting. God says he's going to do something. A man doesn't believe it. So then he starts laughing about it. <laughs> verse 7 says, then Abraham fell on his face and laughed. My, I would like to ask Abraham, what happened? from verse three to verse 17. Because in verse three, you're falling on your face, humbled before God because of his power that's been revealed. But in verse, seven, verse 17, you're falling on your face laughing at the same God who revealed his power to you. But aren't we like that? We do the same thing. We'll rejoice and we'll be excited about God revealing or do, doing something in our life and then God wants to show us something that's beyond what he did before. And we say, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, I've heard that before. You know, I've had people say, ah, oh, you know, I've heard that before. You know, I, I know you preachers, you get all excited about different things. But, you know, uh, you'll be okay. I've had, over the years, I've had people tell me, you know, you're too wound up. You're too excited. Uh, you, you know, you'll be okay. Just calm down a little bit. Well, I'm not going to calm down a little bit. Amen. I don't want to mock God. I don't want to get to a point where I look at the promises of God as something that absolutely cannot be fulfilled. Because when I do that, I'll have a wrong uh, 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 heart relationship with the Lord. Because in verse 17, Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart. You know, the heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? He, he said in his heart. Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? And so watch out. You can fall in the place of mocking. You know, Nathaniel was uh, informed that the Messiah had come in John chapter 1 and verse 46. And Nathaniel said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Philip said unto him, Come and see. <laughs> I love that. Amen. Come and see. Well, wait a minute. The Messiah is here. What are you talking about, uh, oh, Philip? The, the Messiah is coming. Are you telling me this one coming from Nazareth? Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Come and see. 
Because I don't believe that God can save my soul. Why don't you come and see? I don't believe that God can do something miraculous. And my, my family's a mess. You don't understand what I'm dealing with my family. Come and see. We're willing to come and see the God of heaven. God can fulfill things that, that you cannot figure out and be able to adjust. And so promises confirmed. Notice in verse 18 and 19, trusting in the promise is hindered by the pro uh, 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 trusting in the promise is hindered by the present. In verse 18, Abraham said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. Why is Abraham struggling with the birth of Isaac? It's because he's looking at what's going on in the present. And because he's looking at a son that he already has, that was illegitimate. A son that he already has, that was the fulfillment of the flesh. He's looking at a son that he already has in the present and thinking that God can't give him a son uh, when he is 100 years old. In verse 18, he says, Oh, oh that Ishmael, Ishmael may live before thee. And God said, Sarah, thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. Watch out because you're, there's always tempting for us to settle for what we have in the present and disbelieve or just refuse to look forward to what God said he'll do in the future. And uh, to do that is to, to fall in, uh, into a spirit of being stagnant. To do that is to start to fall backwards and backslide. And so we need to trust the promise and don't let things in the present hinder you from doing so. Verse 20 and 21, we're almost done here. Notice the blessed seed is not the same as the promised seed in verse 20 says, and as for Ishmael, I have heard thee, behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. 12 princes shall he beget and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. The blessed seed is not the promised seed. Now, I've had people over the years tell me, you know, well, you know, it's evident God's blessing them. Well, that might be true. God blessed Ishmael. But God's covenant wasn't with Ishmael. God's covenant was based on the promised one that would come, which was Isaac. So don't, listen, don't exchange the better for the best. And basically... Abraham was willing to settle for Ishmael being blessed. And God said, wait a minute, I've already blessed him. But he said, that does not replace my covenant because my covenant is with Isaac. So the blessed seed is not the same as the promised seed. There are things that God may bless you with that are not in accordance with his promises that he has for you. God chooses to bless us. And then I see this, verse 23 through 27. Uh, I see the special call of God should never negate the personal call of God. God has a call on Abraham. Verse 23, Abraham took uh, Ishmael his son and all that were born in, in his house and all that were brought bought with his money, every male, among the men of Abraham's house and circumcised the flesh of their foreskin in the selfsame day as God had said unto him. And Abraham was 90 years old and nine when he was uh, circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. In the selfsame day was Abraham circumcised and Ishmael, his son, and all the men of his house, born in the house, and bought with money of the, of the stranger, were circumcised with him. God had a special call upon Abraham, a special call to establish a nation 
But God had a personal call upon every person in his household to identify with the God of heaven. And God's special call never negates the personal call of God. I believe the personal call of God on my life to surrender to him. And I've done that. But I believe there was a special call of God to bring me to this church and be the pastor 25 years ago. And uh, it was not my desire to come here and be the pastor. I, I don't, I'm not saying that to be mean, but the reality is it wasn't. It wasn't my desire to come here. And my wife and I prayed and said, well, God, if we know you personally called us in the ministry, that's not where I want to go. But if that's what you want, you've got to bring it to pass. There is a difference between a personal call and a special call. And I'm thankful that I was not um, falling into the trap of allowing the personal call of God in my life to negate or to wipe out the special call of God. And God may have something special he wants to do in your life. And you just need to be willing to let God confirm the promise. So Abraham establishing a home. Whole nation of Israel is in reference to Abraham's home. He established a family. The power of God was released to enable Abraham to experience the anointing of God and move of God to be able to have a promised seed, which was Isaac. The position of Abraham, as it is upon all of us, is to follow God's leading and fulfill God's call and promise in our life to fulfill the roles that are necessary in our home, in our church, and in our communities. And then let God confirm the promise. And the promises that God confirms, we cannot allow present circumstances or individuals or whatever it may be to violate that. And uh, I don't, did I put that last things up there? I don't remember. Special call of God should never negate the personal call of God. I put down here, uh, just a closing thought here. Although Abraham did not understand God's rejection of Ishmael, he still needed to keep his personal walk with God right. And you may not understand God doing something that you were desiring for God to do, but you still need to keep your personal walk with God right. Mm -hmm. Then I wrote down this. Ishmael is not the promised seed. But he needed to have a personal commitment to his God. We have a tendency to want to put down Ishmael and exalt Isaac. And we don't know spiritually, scripturally, that Isaac, all of the promises of the nation of Israel being established. And through Isaac, we have the Messiah that comes. We understand that. But God was very clear. He had blessed Ishmael also. So Ishmael was not the promise seed, but he needed to have a personal commitment to his God. And then all those in Abraham's house needed to be right with God. And so let's be careful. Let's be careful that we allow uh, the, the establishing of our homes and our community and certainly our church is based on the special and personal call of God upon our lives. But let's pray. Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be together today. It's been a blessing on Father's Day to be in church been a blessing to be able to study the word of God and consider the life of Abraham. Uh, Lord, there's so much that uh, you worked in his life that helps us to be able to see a God of all grace that can work in our lives. And so, Lord, I pray that you bless the fathers today. I pray that you bless everyone in their homes. I pray uh, that we would see uh, Christians rise up and be spiritual leaders that will fulfill the covenants of God and fulfill the promises of God. Uh, Lord, I just pray for an anointing of the Spirit of God to rest upon us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.